From WLWT, this is Issues. Hello everyone, I'm Curtis Fuller and welcome to Issues. The year was 1954, a landmark U.S. Supreme Court ruling changed America, or at least it was intended to. On May 14, 1954, Chief Justice Earl Warren announced the unanimous decision of the court declaring segregation in public schools unconstitutional. The opinion of the court was, and I quote, we conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal, unquote. Now, as you can imagine, there was opposition, especially in southern states, to that ruling. It was not until a year later, in 1955, the Supreme Court handed down a plan for how this was all going to be done. The court said desegregation was to proceed with, quote, all deliberate speed. Well, here in Ohio, another case was happening about equal education. It was brewing in the courts in the small town of Hillsborough. WLWT News 5's Alexis Rogers has that story. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Ask those who were there. You stayed in your place. They can tell you Hillsborough in the 50s was a reflection of the nation's deep-rooted disparities. And my mom always told me that no matter where you go, you be yourself. But at that time, we also knew we weren't allowed to go into a show. We had to set at a certain spot. We weren't allowed to go into different stores. So we knew a lot of things. And at that time, I thought we didn't understand why. There had been rumblings, you know, but this was very early before the Civil Rights Movement got going. This was before Dr. King stepped up, before the um, Montgomery bus boycott even. Susan Banyas grew up here. As a child, she found the nation's problems were right beyond the glass. When I was eight years old, and um, I was in Mrs. Mallory's third grade classroom, and every day outside the window, I would see Negro women arriving with their children. In 1954, Teresa Williams and Joyce Kittrell were two of those children walking to the Lincoln School. It was a lot of kids. It was about 30 kids to one room. But the teachers did the best they could with what they had. And they took time for each class in that room. We never had seen a map before. And we never really seen a good book that was there. And there's two or three subjects that we was kind of wondering, well, we never had these before when we went to Lincoln School. And so it was kind of a, in a way, you enjoyed it because you were seeing something new and different. But yet, you was just wondering, am I doing it right? And so that's when we had to rely upon our parents a lot because they helped us a lot through this situation because as a child, you know, if you don't know something, you begin to wonder, well, why am I here? What am I doing? And then as they would tell us and get us to understand that we have to learn, we had to learn because we want to be equal to the white children as when we went to school. So she put pressure that we were equal. All we had to do was just learn to do the right things. Hillsborough administrators and town officials refused to integrate the schools. The federal mandate meaning nothing more than a piece of paper. Philip Partridge, a well-respected county engineer, didn't agree. No one was in the school. It was late at night. And it was the day after the 4th of July parade. So Independence Day, he's like, that's it. I'm torching this school. Partridge attempted to burn down the Lincoln School. He wanted to force administrators to allow black children into white schools. The town was in shock and pushed the blame in the direction that made the most sense to them. And they tried to arrest a young black boy for the fire. So Mr. Partridge, after so long, decided he had to step up and tell him it was him. And by him being an engineer, you know, he was something big in the town. And it kind of made them, you know, wonder, you know, Partridge stepped forward, demanding equality for children he barely knew. Partridge served nine months in jail while the children stayed segregated. What was that like? Were you all shocked? Well, I think back then, just hearing the parents, that they were shocked, but yet they were glad that he stood up for what he had done. Because not only did it hurt, it really hurt his family too. It really hurt them just as bad as it did, you know, our school fight 
trying to understand why he had to do something like that in order to get this all started. Once that happened, then what? Well, what happened was the school board fixed up the damaged school and sent the, the black kids back to their damaged school rather than integrate. And that's when the women knew they had a case. Nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows my sorrow. Women like Imogene Curtis, Gertrude Clemens Hudson, Elsie Stewart Scott, and others refused to send their kids back to the Lincoln School. Dozens pulled their children out. Our parents wouldn't send us back down there. So we all had homeschool and uh, uh, was lady Quaker teachers would come from Wilmington, bring homework, and we did our home uh, school work in the homes. Swing low. Morning from 1954 to 1956, the marching mothers, as they came to be known, walked miles with their children. They went from their traditionally black neighborhoods to the schools they desired so badly. Everybody met down at the bottom of the hill, and we marched from down at the bottom of the hill on Walnut all the way across town to the Webster Elementary. The reaction from the white establishment was visceral. Up across, but the main one was uh, at uh, Blake, at uh, Blake, Blakey, their name is Blake. And uh, I remember we was living across the street from them. Mom told them, says, well, you can burn the cross, try to scare us, but until you burn us, you might as well forget it because we're going to keep on marching. But what began as a personal battle in this small town soon grew. She set me down, she said, now, Joyce, you're going to be the plaintiff in the case. And she said, no. And she said, that means that you may have to go into court and they may be asking you questions and things. She says, no, I'm not going to tell you what to say. She said, I want you to be able to answer yourself. At 12 years old, Joyce Clemens Kittrell became the central figure in a new court battle, Clemens versus the Board of Education of Hillsborough, Ohio, the first federal court case challenging integration in Ohio schools. And we had so many different uh, courts we went to. And the judges, they had uh, really begin to accuse the parents of different things. And I remember they went to this one hearing and the judge told them, says, your children are delinquent because they're not going to school and we're going to take your children from you. And uh, the parent says, well, we've got Quaker teachers teaching them and all that. Well, you're still not, you're not properly doing your children right. And we're going to put you in jail if you don't send them back to Lincoln School. And I remember my mother told, the, told him, says, I tell you what, you let me go home, do my work, and take and get everything done, then you can put me in jail. What many began calling the school fight gained momentum and help from the Dayton NAACP. The case caught the attention of national leaders, Thurgood Marshall and Constance Baker Motley. Finally, a judgment day. They were in there for a while, and everybody kept wondering, well, what's taking so long? And so finally the door opened. We all stood up that we was going to go in. And uh, Mom told me to get my toys up. And so uh, but he said, no, stay right where you are. He said, y'all won the case. You don't have to go in this time. So the victory was historic, the first successful integration case in Ohio history. But the victory was also costly. The marching mothers and their children continued to battle entrenched racism. As for Philip Partridge, his own desperate bid to end segregation changed the direction of his life. Well, he spent about nine months in prison, finally was released, came back, couldn't get his job. Um, and 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 went went on to become an engineer. Went on to engineer um, out in Four Corners, um, New Mexico area. Then he went to Akron. Today, more than 60 years later, you can see the impact of the sacrifice of the marching mothers and Philip Partridge. Children of all colors share the hallways of Hillsboro schools. Few of them having any idea of the steep price paid by a brave few. By the fact, a lot of folks don't know about it. Really is. Uh, uh, 
something we could work on on our own. Working on teaching today's children about the history of their small town and its huge and lasting impact. Like different ships passing through the night, the marching mothers and the students never met Philip Partridge, but shared a passion that led strangers to the same purpose. It's time, America. It's time, Cincinnati. It's time, Hillsboro. It's time, Portland. It's time all, for all of us in our hearts to step across and, and get to know each other. In Hillsboro, Alexis Rogers, WLWT News 5. Interesting story, huh? Many of you probably did not know that story. In a moment, I will talk to Alexis and she'll tell us a little bit more about uh, her research in this. And she has some background really with Brown versus Board of Education, seeing it up close uh, when she worked in Little Rock. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back everyone, I'm Curtis Fuller and welcome to Issues. Uh, just a fascinating story about uh, the history out there in Hillsboro and the young lady who worked on that story is Alexis Rogers, a familiar face here at Channel 5. Welcome. Thank you very much, I'm excited first, to be here. First time I got a chance to interview you like this. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> uh, let's give a little background. You've been with Channel 5, uh, you were telling me about seven months now. So yes, so it hasn't been long, but I've been able to uh, really delve into this community. It's a great, fantastic community that we get to cover every day. That story seemed perfect for you, given that you had just come from Little Rock and knowing the history there. But uh, give us some perspective of how you um, found out about this story and what you learned from it. You know, it, it's funny because this story idea was a direct, um, it was birthed from the election season. When we were covering the election, we got a chance to go to so many different communities, talk to people about what was on their minds. And when I was in Little Rock, I did a lot of education reporting, got a chance to even interview some of the Little Rock Nine, uh, and that was important for this. And we would talk to people in these communities and a couple different people, even some politicians were like, have you heard about what happened in Hillsboro? I just met this lady and she she told me about what happened in Hillsboro, but a lot of people just don't know about it. And so we went to Hillsboro uh, kind of hunting for the story and it was it was there and it was gold and it was important. Yeah, I, I was noticing that roughly uh, the population, about 5% African American mm -hmm. um, in Hillsboro, according to some statistics that I saw, um, not sure what the population was then. What's interesting is a lot of people still don't know that story. Yes. Uh, it's not being taught uh, on a regular basis in the education system. Yes, not even in Hillsboro. You know, that, that last gentleman that you saw uh, in that piece, he was the superintendent, the current superintendent. And there were conversations that we had where he was just finding out about some of these things. And so I think that's the important thing about storytelling is that you don't know where you're trying to go until you know what's happened before you. Mm -hmm. And the fact that those ladies still live in that community and they choose to do that because they wanted to see change and see if it was going to continue to stay that way. Are, are they optimistic about what they're seeing in, in the community? Um, or, and are they bitter by, they didn't seem bitter, uh, they seemed, um, would be the word, uh, just committed to get that story out, but they didn't seem bitter by, by what took place. I think commitment is the absolute best way to describe all of the ladies. I mean, there's still one marching mother left, uh, and she's actually in the Cincinnati area. She's 100 years old. Mm. Uh, she was a little sick when we were doing this project. And I think that when it comes to their commitment, they understand that things happen in life and they understand what fighting looks like. And the, the fight didn't stop there. I mean, Joyce was one of the first, you know, black women to be an engineer in the mind. And people kept telling her, well, you're a woman, you can't do that. And she kept telling them, well, obviously you don't know what I did when I was 12. So, you know, at 35, <laughs> it's okay. Um, you know, so that they continued to fight. And as far as now, I mean, look at where we are in a nation, as a nation right now, especially with our educational system. I think where they are, and we talked about this, they said that they feel like history is repeating itself in some instances, mm. which is a very hollowed uh, 
thought process, right? You know, some, in some ways they feel like we're going backwards. In other cases, they understand that their children did get a chance to go to Hillsborough schools. But, you know, one mother told me, hey, my daughter has three doctorates and can't mm. get a job in the school district. So it just depends on what perspective that you're looking at. How does that happen? I mean, I, that, that doesn't make you know, I think that's the question that a lot of people have been asking, especially uh, within this last year. They ask it all the time in our educational systems. And what Joyce and I talked about was the fact that now, yes, you're telling people you can go to any school that you want to, but systematically, is there still a segregating line? You know, you can look at any public school district especially. Are the resources the same? Are you treating these kids the same? So it's some of the same conversations. Hmm. It, I tell you, the other fascinating thing, you know, we, we hear the name Thurgood Marshall, but we forget that he was pounding the pavement in small communities like Hillsboro, Cincinnati, and other places. You know, Thurgood Marshall, I think he's a perfect representation of double consciousness. We always talk about W.E.B. E. Du Bois' idea, right? Mm -hmm but it's still very present. I mean, how many times have we seen in our justice system right now where people have to exist in both atmospheres? And so you get great pair ups like with, you know, Constance Baker Motley. I mean, come on, she has her own story, right? Mm -hmm, Especially right. within Ohio, but you have all these great people coming together. And then you have Philip Partridge, who ironically never met these women, specifically never met these students, but still turned his world upside down in order to do what he felt was right. Yeah, fascinating story. I'm glad you got a chance to, uh, to do that work on that story. And we should note that uh, Robert Busby was the photographer and editor on that, on that piece. All right, we'll be back in a moment. Perfect time to be doing this, having this conversation when you see that piece about Hillsboro. With me uh, now is Herschel Daniels, who is the chair of the Friends of the African Union. You might have heard, you might have heard that there is a $30 billion agreement on the table. Yeah, it, it's part of, <laughs> it, it, look, there, there's probably going to be a quarter trillion dollar mm. by the June 19th, okay? But these are community benefit agreements and they're a derivative of the Community Reinvestment Act. Now, uh, Fifth Third uh, did a 30 billion. Now, my organization followed our national organization, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, mm -hmm. which is the lead in this because they've done this before. 30 billion dollars. No, <laughs> remember the whole banking industry in the country is right. $150 trillion, right? right? Okay, so when you talk about this, you're talking about Fifth Third has about $315 billion in assets, uh, but it controls a subsidiary that last year did $762 billion in transactions. That makes that 30. Yeah, okay, okay. well, 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 well that, that you <laughs> understand, it's a, it's a $30 billion agreement, it's for five years, it's for their whole footprint, but we're Cincinnati, we're the headquarters. Okay, so it was signed last November 18th, I was privileged to be one of the 136 organizations, okay, that signed the agreement under the leadership of John Taylor of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, and it was co-founded by Morris Williams, and I think mm -hmm. you know Morris, oh, yeah, okay? Yeah. And you this know, is so, something he's been talking about for years. He means, but see, people yeah. understand he's been talking, but he's also been doing, right. okay? Now, he may have retired, but he's come out of retirement, <laughs> okay? And what we're, we're, we're doing is affecting this $30 billion agreement that said $11 billion, okay, will go for mortgages, $10 billion will go for business, $9 billion will go for community development, $93 million will be uh, 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 donated, okay. But remember, it's over the footprint of 10 states, but it's also segmented for 10 cities that are primary targets, and Cincinnati's the lead. How, did, how, did, how was Cincinnati picked or selected? Where's Fifth Third headquarters? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. all right. Yeah. So, we're, uh, and for the first time, Fifth Third, since I think the bank was formed in 1858 as a trader bank, okay, as a bank that uh, did slave financing, trading, et cetera, 
there's a black man now on the executive council. Now, Fifth Third got hit with some negative publicity about uh, was it, 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 it's, uh, yeah. it, it, that there, didn't have it, an impact it, it, on it, this. Again, cause and effect. Okay, the leadership of the bank right now, okay, uh, is not the leadership that was in place then. Uh, Brian Lamb is newly appointed. Okay, uh, you have a woman and a, a, a black man who are now on the leadership of the bank, not just on the board, but on the leadership who make decisions. The man who's in charge of this, Brian Lamb, of the thirty billion dollars, okay, uh, uh, wide bank wide. All right. Then we have uh, uh, local, okay, uh, development, and it's an agreement. Okay, this isn't just a promise. It's not a, a blitz. Okay, that's mm -hmm. a media blitz. It's an actual filed agreement. Okay, and a commitment. And as uh, Greg Carmichael, who was the signature for the bank, okay, uh, said at the signing ceremony, uh, "This is the floor. If we do more business." then we do more business, but this is the business we do. It has a specific agreement, and if you're a member of the National Community Reinvestment Coalition, see, we're, we're gonna have a meeting next month with the chairwoman of the Federal Reserve is gonna be the keynote speaker. So we're talking about an organization that's over a quarter century old. We're talking about an organization that has done over a quarter of a billion dollars worth of small business loans already. My organization, Friends of the African Union, is dedicated to the 47 million Americans who are descendants of direct descendants, because we're all uh, descendants of Africa, but the direct descendants uh, from uh, the uh, African experience in America. All right, but we're part of this whole international movement of the African Union, which is in 2012, did you know, here in Cincinnati? President Obama chose Cincinnati to sell America to Africa. Okay, but it was a State Department. It wasn't a Cincinnati move. Just like this isn't just a Cincinnati move. It's a state of Ohio move. It is a 10 state move. But we're the headquarters. We, we, we lead the way. It, it really is fascinating. And after the meeting, I, so I want to do a whole show next month mm -hmm. where we really break this down because people, are, the, I know the one question people want to know is how do I access that? So. We'll have you come back after that, that and meeting. That, that's, that's fine. That's, and and meet, meet the leadership of, of the organization. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. All right. We will be back to wrap things up in a moment. I really enjoy shows like this. A little bit of history and a little bit of present and future uh, rolled into one. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Curtis Fuller. Have a nice day.